It is the committee policy that all witnesses are to be sworn in. Could you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that the witnesses responded in the affirmative. The committee is, is pleased to welcome Ms. Carolyn Gallagher, uh, Chairman of the Board of Governors uh, for the United States Postal Service. Carolyn Gallagher was named a Governor of the U.S. Postal Service by President George W. Bush on November, in November of 2004. She currently serves as Chairman of the Compensation and Management Resources Committee and is Vice Chair of the Audit and Finance Committee. The Honorable Dan Blair is Chairman of the Postal Regulatory Commission. Uh, Mr. Blair serves as the first chairman of the Postal Regulatory Commission, a successor agency to the former Postal Rate Commission. He was unanimously confirmed as a commissioner of the former Postal Rate, Rate Commission on December, I'm sorry, in December of 2006 by United States Senate and was designated chairman by President George W. Bush during the same year. Uh, I now welcome, the committee would now welcome opening statements, Ms. Gallagher. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. The current economic downturn has hit our country with a speed and a depth that the Postal Service, like most other businesses, could not anticipate. The dramatic decline in mail volume over the past 18 months is simply outpacing the rate at which we can reduce our costs given the tools available to us. Adding to this unprecedented financial challenge is the requirement passed in the Postal Law of 2006 that the Postal Service make payments of $5.4 billion or more per year to fund future retiree health care obligations. If not for this payment, the Postal Service would have earned a profit of $2.8 billion in 2008, an exceptionally challenging year. The Postmaster General and his team are responding quickly and decisively to these challenges. They are undertaking a range of efforts, including the elimination of work hours, major reductions in administrative overhead, and aggressive network consolidations that will eliminate almost $10 billion in the next two fiscal years. Yet even with our best efforts, we will still come up short. Under current law, we cannot close the widening gap between revenue and costs and still finance today's service levels for this fiscal year. Despite our aggressive plan to reduce costs over the next two years, our projections show that we will still lose another $13 billion over that period. The Postal Service has been a self-funded government entity for more than 30 years, and we plan to remain so. Today, we respectfully request your urgent attention in providing the Postal Service, not with financial assistance, but with the flexibility needed to better align our resources and our responsibilities. Our first request is for a change to fund our retiree health benefit premiums from the Retirement Health Benefits Fund rather than from operating revenue. The Postal Act of 2006 requires an extraordinary obligation that no other federal agency or private sector company has to meet. Maintaining the current accelerated payment schedule for future obligations and having to borrow money to do so when we cannot make ends meet today puts the Postal Service in an unnecessarily perilous position. It's like planning to add a new room to your home when the house is on fire. We greatly appreciate the efforts of Representatives John McHugh and Danny Davis, who introduced H.R. 22, which would allow this funding change and save at least $2 billion per year for eight years. We ask all members of this subcommittee to support this legislation. But even if H.R. 22 is enacted, we will still forecast a loss of $9 billion over the next two fiscal years. Therefore, additional and immediate action is needed. The board agrees with management and believes that going to five-day-per-week delivery is the best option for restoring our financial health and ensuring our long-term future. The volume of mail we are delivering no longer produces enough revenue to cover the costs of six-day delivery to 150 million households and businesses. We need to adapt our network to reflect the changing demand for our products and services. Going to five-day delivery once fully implemented could reduce costs by $3.5 billion per year 
and can be achieved without substantial impact on our customers and our employees. In fact, two recent public opinion polls show that the American people prefer the option of five-day delivery over a significant increase in stamp prices. Another critical element in ensuring the long-term financial health of the Postal Service is strong and effective leadership. And on this matter, the governors are certain that the Postal Service has the right leader in Jack Potter. I welcome your request to address the issue of the Postmaster General's compensation package. Our board formed a Compensation and Management Resources Committee three years ago because we know how important it is to attract, retain, and develop outstanding leadership for the Postal Service. Congress recognized this when it enacted a law requiring that executive pay at the Postal Service be comparable to jobs with similar responsibilities in the private sector. In 2008, the Postmaster General's salary was $263,575, the amount permitted by Congress. In addition, based on his outstanding leadership in a very difficult time, the governors awarded Mr. Potter a performance incentive of $135,041, which is deferred and will be paid in 10 annual installments after he leaves Postal Service employment. The balance of his compensation package includes the cost of Mr. Potter's security detail provided by the Postal Inspection Service and the estimated change in the future value of his federal pension through the Civil Service Retirement System based on his 31 years of service. Mr. Potter has earned the compensation he received. The governors believe his achievements in 2008 were both remarkable and unprecedented. Last year, the Postmaster General and his team reduced costs by over $2 billion, more than double what was planned, while still providing record levels of service to the American people. The governors have complete confidence in Mr. Potter. We need his leadership now more than ever to lead us through the crisis we face. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I want to emphasize that our current financial situation is dire. The legislative changes we are requesting will not cost the federal government anything or require an appropriation by Congress, but they will allow us much needed flexibility to meet our obligations and to adapt the Postal Service to a changing business environment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz, Mr. Davis, thank you for this chance to testify this afternoon. Today, the Postal Service is facing- Sir, would you, I'm sorry, would you move that mic closer Absolutely. to you? Absolutely, sorry about right. that. Thank you, sir. Today, the Postal Service is facing dire financial difficulties. They're likely to worsen before they improve. The current economic crisis has substantially impacted Postal Service volumes and revenues. The first quarter of fiscal year 2009 showed volume declines for all classes. First class mail declined an additional 7.3% and standard mail declined 11%. And all total volume in the first quarter declined 9.3%. This trend is continuing into calendar year 2009 at an accelerated rate. Total mail volume in January 2009 is 16% below levels reported in January 2008. The service reported it lost almost three quarters of a billion dollars in January as well. We expect it to report a further deteriorating condition for February with continued dramatic volume decreases as well as a significant decrease in revenues. Should double digit volume and revenue declines continue, Commission analysis shows a cash shortfall could be expected by the end of the fiscal year. Based on information given the Commission, the Postal Service projects a $12.4 billion net operating deficit for the fiscal year. To address this situation, the Postal Service has identified internal cost savings reductions of $5.9 billion for FY 2009. However, further reductions are needed if the Postal Service is to meet its payroll and other expenses. To address this, the Postal Service has asked Congress for authority to reduce delivery days from six days a week to five. Based on the Commission's universal service study, we estimate potential annual savings of almost two billion. However, this action carries the risk that cu customers would be harmed and some mailers may choose to mail less or leave the mail stream altogether. The service has also sought relief in seeking suspension of its retiree health premium payments. This is the approach taken in H.R. 22. For fiscal year 09, those payments would be almost $2 billion. However, more relief may be required to meet the service's cash flow needs this year should current trends continue. Determining the amount of needed relief begins in viewing the service's debt ceiling and borrowing authority. 
Over the last three years, the Postal Service has increased its long-term debt from $0 in FY 2005 to $6.5 billion through the first quarter of fiscal year 2009. The Postal Service has a $15 billion debt ceiling and may increase their debt load no more than $3 billion in any one year. Borrowing against its debt ceiling and suspension of the retiree health benefit premium will likely prove insufficient to make up for the cash shortfall. Congress should review the required $5.4 billion payment required to pre-fund retiree health benefits. This payment could be suspended in part or adjusted in an effort to ensure the service remains financially viable. The Postal Service can raise additional revenues from rate adjustments. Last week, the Commission approved the service's rate increase request to adjust postal rates by 3.8%. These adjustments will take effect May 11th. This amount is an inflation-based increase as intended by the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. Should current inflation trends continue, the price adjustment for 2010 will likely be less than 1%. Other cost reduction measures must be considered as well but these impact difficult policy areas where Congress has expressed, at least in years past, a desire for the maintenance of the status quo. The Commission's role is to provide transparency into postal financial operations. I hope today's testimony sheds some light on the tough choices in helping the subcommittee evaluate the service's financial situation. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, let me begin. I I'm going to uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Gallagher. Uh, let's start off with, uh, uh, with Mr. Potter's uh, compensation. I understand you're, you're the chair of the compensation committee. Is that correct? Uh, I was chair of that committee until I became the chair of the board. When did that happen? In, in February. Oh, okay. Early so, February. So with respect to uh, Mr. Potter's uh, previous salary, uh, the 2008 salary, you were? I was chair of you the were chair. compensation okay. and management resources. You know, I've been reviewing uh, Mr. Potter's record. Uh, he has had some good years, but uh, you know, I, I just want to point out in, in 2007, uh, the post office lost $5 billion. Uh, in, in 08, they lost $2.8 billion. And now, you know, based on testimony here, uh, in 09, we should expect, uh, you know, Losses somewhere in the range of nine to ten billion dollars, unless we do something drastic and and and, uh, and bite into those losses uh, with with significant cuts in service. Now, there there are a couple of statutes that that bear on the compensation of of the postmaster general. One is is uh, an earlier statute that that tied his compensation or ties his compensation to that the salary of the uh, Vice President of the United States. He is to earn no more than 120 percent of what Joe Biden earns. Uh, there is another statute that you referred to uh, passed in 2006 that, that uh, indicates that these, these salaries should be uh, comparable in some way with those in the private sector. Uh, can you tell me how, how we ended up uh, paying all this money uh, to, to Mr. Potter in 08 when, what was the thinking of the compensation committee when we lost $3 billion and, uh, and we gave Mr. Potter an entire package. Now, I understand some of that is his pension of about $800,000. Um, I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, Mr. Potter's salary, the amount that he actually was paid in 2008, was $263,000. Uh, that was the limit that was set by Congress in the Postal Accountability Act of 2006. In addition, the board did award Mr. Potter a, per, a per, performance incentive award of $135,000 based on what we believe was remarkable and unprecedented achievement. In the face of very difficult year, falling volumes because of the recession, Mr. Potter reacted quickly and decisively, and he and his team uh, reduced work hours by 50 million work hours. They saved the Postal Service over $2 billion, more than double what was originally planned. Uh, all this, while doing those changes, they also uh, were able to provide record levels of service to the American people, and we believe that's a remarkable accomplishment. 
I also believe that when you look at Mr. Potter's compensation, you have to consider the size of the job. The Postmaster General is wanting, running one of the largest organizations in the country, indeed the world. Uh, the Postal Service has 650,000 employees, about the amount of Federal Express and UPS combined. With $75 billion in revenues, we would be in the top tier of Fortune 100 companies if we were on that list. We have 37,000 facilities and retail outlets. We do have a statute that says that we should pay the executives comparable to their peers in the private sector. Yet, based on an outside consultant who specializes in executive compensation, Mr. Potter and his team make a small fraction, only 15 percent, of what people running similarly sized organizations are making. We believe we are lucky to have a Postmaster General the caliber of Mr. Potter, and we believe that he earned every penny that he was paid. You understand the, the, the frustration in, in the public, though, uh, when they take the whole picture here. They're looking at the prospect of five-day delivery. They're looking at the prospect of the post office closing. They're looking at the prospect of, you know, 150,000 employees uh, uh, retiring or uh, going away from the post office, uh, regional centers closing down. And here we have, and, and their rates going up. I might, might add, and uh, we're, we're giving the gentleman a $135,000 bonus. It just, uh, and I understand the idea of a com comparable salary. However, I, I don't agree with the premise that just because AIG or Merrill Lynch is giving people bonuses for driving the, the company into the ground that we should, we should emulate that. That's certainly not the, the idea here, right? We're, we're trying to reward you know, positive performance. And like I said, you know, 07, we lose 5 billion, 08, 2.8 billion, we lose. And then now we have the prospect of losing somewhere in the area of $10 billion in 09 with all of this pain. Uh, it just, uh, it just defies uh, logic to me. And, and, and we're not talking about a 10% or a 20% bonus. We're talking about 50% of the gentleman's salary. Uh, it just, uh, I know it's not taxpayer funded. This is from revenues generated by the Postal Service. But still, uh, given the, the need in the system, I just, uh, I, I, I question the, 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 the wisdom of this. Uh, I don't know, when, when exactly did you determine his salary? Uh, well, first, Mr. Chairman, I, I have to take exception at the comparison of the United States Postal Service to AIG. The Postal Service is the most trusted government agency and has been for the past five years. It's one of the most trusted organizations in the country. Uh, Mr. Potter and his team saved billions of dollars, $8 billion over the last seven years, $2 billion last year for the Postal Service. He's uh, a dedicated public servant for 31 years. He's been one of the most successful Postmaster Generals in the history of the Postal Service. Uh, well, you, you know, I, what, I, what, what, I, what I would say is this. I, I compared the practice of giving bonuses in the financial industry to people who were losing money to the practice of giving bonuses to executives at the post office at a time when they're losing money. I think that's the comparison. I'm not comparing the United States Postal Service to AIG. Uh, however, there, there is there is this comparability language in the in the statute, and I just want to make sure that it we are we are comparing apples to apples, and that the practice that we're trying to emulate in the private sector is when they do a good job and get a bonus, we'll use that example uh, in, at the post office and not uh, not reward. Uh, performance that is less than satisfactory. Well, I, I'm violating my own rule here, so I'm going to allow uh, Mr. Chaffetz from Utah, the ranking member, to uh, uh, ask questions for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for being here. I, pre I, I appreciate your dedication and commitment to public service. Uh, I also appreciate what Mr. Potter and the whole organization. I, I wouldn't give Mr. Potter all the credit. Uh, certainly he has a, a talented team and men and women at all levels 
who are performing great work and have accomplished uh, many things, uh, the reduction in overtime hours and, so, and such. Uh, it really is, no doubt, a team effort. But nevertheless, I have some deep concerns. You may have a football team that's uh, fighting and doing everything they can, and, and you want to pat some people on the back. But if you're losing the game and you come up in the red, I just don't see any room to, at some point, say, we just can't be handing out bonuses to the coach. And, um, and so my question is, and I, and I also hear you um, talk and express a concern that he is undercompensated, in your view, many ways, uh, for his base salary, uh, to com try to compare to a $10 million salary for a comparable pub uh, uh, private sector job. Um, and maybe we should revisit uh, that, that whole scenario. But is this $135,000 bonus just a way to run around the statute and give him extra compensation that you feel is, is deserved? I mean, at what point do you actually cut it off and say, we lost money? And we're either going to have to go to the taxpayers or we're going to have to continue to suck it up until we get to the, to the end of the block. Uh, Mr. Ch uh, Congressman Chaffetz, I think there's a very important distinction here, and that is that the Postal Service would have made a profit of $2.8 billion, $2 billion in 2008 if it were not for the requirement passed by Congress that we pre-fund our retiree health care obligation and we had to make a payment of $5.6 billion in 2008. And if not for that payment, the Postal Service would have made a profit of $2.6 billion, despite the fact that our volume had the biggest loss in the history of the Postal Service. The fact that Mr. Potter and his team were able to offset that volume loss and reduce headcount or workforce by 50 million work hours and save the Postal Service $2 billion while maintaining the best service levels we've ever had is truly remarkable. And I do believe that he earned more than we are able to pay him as a public servant. So you would have actually compensated even more than, than what you did? No, I believe that we, he was paid fairly as a public servant, but I think the work that he did and the, what the, the accomplishments that he made for the Postal Service were worth more. Uh, I, just my own personal belief, I do think there is a difference in the rank and file and them accomplishing the goals set forward by executive management. But in this, con in this, in this case, I just, I'm so concerned that we're taking a, a special effect on somebody who has to deal with everything but the ifs. You can't just say if, if. The reality is it lost money, and now we're coming to the point where we have to make some dramatic changes, dramatic changes. And this is somewhat symbolic of, of the, the challenges that we face. I mean, if we adjust Mr. Potter's uh, compensation package, that's not going to uh, have a material effect on the overall. But he is the leadership. He is the CEO. He is the, he is the leader there. Uh, do you have any plans or inclination or anything in, in the works to actually change the way um, executives are bonused out? Absolutely not. We believe that the, remar that the achievements of Master General and his team have been remarkable given the challenges they are facing, that we are lucky to have a team the caliber that we have who are willing to work at a small fraction uh, only 15 percent of what their peers or what they could make in the private sector. We believe that they have saved billions of dollars while providing record levels of service and that they are earning every penny that they are paid. What, what is the total, he, he certainly wasn't the only person to get a bonus, correct? What is the total amount or what total dollars that were paid out in bonuses to the executive level in the Postal Service overall? Uh, Congressman Chaffetz, that's uh, that was fully disclosed in our 10K. I just don't know what the answer and is. I, that I don't have those facts and figures, but I certainly we want to get Is it in the millions of dollars? Is it? Uh, no, sir. The I mean, the incentive payment a, for Mr. Potter was 135. No, I meant for the executive level uh, postal service employees. What 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 is the total? I, I'm sorry, I don't have that, but I'd be happy to happy to get to that. It was fully disclosed. I just don't have the facts and figures. Okay. Mind. Yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate if you'd submit that in somewhat uh, timely, timely fashion. I'd, I'd certainly. Uh, last question uh, in this round here. You, you, expect, you expressed, quote, uh, complete confidence, end quote, in Mr. Potter. Um, in light of this investigation that is now going to move forward, does that taint or have any bearing on how your, your concerns about Mr. Potter? No, sir, not at all. M Jack Potter is one of the most successful postmaster generals in the history of the Postal Service. 
Uh, soon after taking office in 2001, he was hit with the events of 9-11 and then the anthrax tragedies that followed soon after. He restored the public's confidence in the U.S. mail, returned us to financial health. He has saved the Postal Service billions of dollars, he and his team, uh, while providing record levels of service. We are very lucky to have a Postmaster General, the caliber of Mr. Potter, and the board has complete confidence in him, and we, he is uniquely and singularly qualified to lead us forward through the situations we face today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ms. Gallagher, Mr. Blair. It's good to see you both. Let me begin with you, Mr. Blair, and perhaps uh, ask you, the Postal Service is not a private corporation, or is it? It's not a government <laughs> agency, or is it? What is it? It's an independent establishment within the executive branch. It's wholly owned by the federal government. Uh, employees of the Postal Service uh, receive um, benefits just like any other federal employee does. And so in many respects, it is treated like a federal agency. I think the overriding distinct, two overriding distinctions is its governance structure. Postmaster General is appointed by the Board of Governors, or excuse me, by the governors, um, as opposed to being a cabinet level member, such as uh, he was in 1970. And the revenues uh, that pay their operating expenses are generated through the sale of goods and services, unlike most federal agencies. And so it's not exactly a government agency, but it functions in many ways like a government agency. I think generally, yes. It's not exactly a private corporation, but it functions in many ways like a private corporation. So I guess I'm wondering whether or not there's any possibility that sometimes there can be mixed signals. For example, if Congress directs the Board of Governors to compensate postal executives uh, in a comparable way, similar to what takes place in private corporations of private industry, um, would that appear to be what uh, the Board of Governors may have been? Well, I think oftentimes legislation sends some mixed signals. And I think that's just part of the balancing factor that, uh, that public servants have to uh, undergo and evaluate. Um, it's told to operate and act like a business, but it has substantial public service mandates. Uh, we outlined a number of those mandates in our universal service study. One of the most significant of those mandates is providing six-day-a-week delivery. There is a culture in corporate America in relationship to executive compensation that many people now are taking a hard look at, and, and not just the postal service, not just uh, pseudo-governmental agencies. But people are taking a real hard look at the culture that has developed relative to executive compensation in corporate America. And Ms. Gallinger, my, my question is, given this look that has taken place, has the uh, Postal Board of Governors uh, had discussions of reviewing any of its policies in relationship to response to the public outcry that we are currently experiencing relative to this issue? Uh, well, first, let me say, Congressman Davis, that the board did struggle greatly to try to balance two competing statutes and come up with a compensation that we felt like was the best balance between the two. Uh, however, we still believe firmly that the compensation for Postmaster General and his team is more than fair given the achievements and the challenges that they are facing and the actions they are taking to try to keep the Postal Service 
financially sound in this crisis. So we have we have full confidence in what they're doing, and we believe they are they are paid fairly. So the Board of Governors is in fact cognizant and and displays sensitivity to the increasing concern about the issue. Of uh, course. We've heard Mr. Potter talk about um, his optimism in relationship to the ability of the Postal Service to grow volume. And of course, um, I'm trying to rationalize in my own mind the ability to do that. Um, how does the Board of Governors feel in relationship to that? Well, we, we certainly share the Postmaster General's confidence in the future viability of the Postal Service with help, obviously, from Congress, as we have requested. Uh, there are opportunities for us to grow this business. We do have new flexibility that was given to us under the Postal Accountability Act, especially in terms of pricing our shipping products. And we want to take full advantage of it. We are trying to take full advantage of it. And in fact, we are growing market share in our expedited mail products, and we're very proud of that. As the Postmaster General discussed this morning, there, we are making uh, technological investments that we think will add value to the mail, intelligent mail barcode being the, the best example of that. So we think there are opportunities. Uh, that being said, there is a structural change in the way Americans are communicating and the Postal Service needs to, needs to change with it. We need to make sure we match our resources and adjust our resources with the changing demand for our products and services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gallagher, we have a sort of a parade of horribles that are rolling out here in 2009. We're looking at you know, the possibility of losing $10 billion unless we do something drastic. We're looking at post office closings and, and uh, Cuts in service, perhaps, major cuts in service. Not only that, but we're looking at the possibility of bumping up against the debt limit, the statutory debt limit for the post office as well, depending on how things go. Uh, in, in that environment, uh, looking at 2009, you, when I asked Postmaster General Potter about the possibility of him getting a, a bonus in 2009, he said, based on where we're at, I, I'm paraphrasing here, I should not, uh, this is not a quote, but words to the effect, I, I don't expect a bonus in 2009. I'm just asking you, is that in line, as someone who sat at one point on the Compensation Committee, uh, what are your views on that in 2009? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's too early to know what his compensation will be. The board, it's a decision for the full board. Uh, Mr. Potter was right. He, uh, it is a very difficult year for us, and he has very difficult and challenging goals. Uh, but the full board has not discussed that yet, and um, it is a decision for the full board. Well, I think something you should chew on uh, is that if you do end up bumping up against your statutory debt limit, you're going to have to come to Congress to have that increased. And it would be very difficult for members of Congress uh, to, you know, approve a system or provide support to a system that they thought was, was, uh, was not being fair uh, in terms of leading by example. Uh, you know, if you're going to ask the American people to, to absorb pain and closings and, and uh, increase debt, there needs to be some type of uh, reflection in the management team that acknowledges we're, we're in some tough times. It can't be, it, can, it cannot be business as usual or business as we hoped it to be. But, you know, we, get, we need to be in this together. Mr. Chairman, can I, I'd like to say that I, I believe increasing our debt limit was the last thing we should do. Uh, by the end of this year, we will have $10 billion in debt. Uh, any additional debt will just put further financial pressure on the Postal Service. It right. will increase our current costs because we'll have more interest costs. I think it will make it very difficult for the Postal Service to return to financial health, perhaps even impossible for the Postal Service to return to financial health. We have laid out a plan, a very aggressive action plan that we are taking to reduce costs uh, while maintaining service. We have asked for your assistance in two areas. 
one to help us restructure our retiree health care payment, and one to, to give us the flexibility to go to five-day delivery, which we believe will help us match our resources to our changing demand for our products. With those two changes, we are firmly in belief that the Postal Service will return to financial health and be viable for the future. I understand uh, the prospects of HR 22, and again, uh, you know, I have great respect for both of the sponsors, both uh, Mr. Davis, who is here, and, and Mr. McHugh, who is not. I, and I, I regard them very, very highly on, on this as well as other matters. Uh, we're going to have to look at that. Uh, in the out years, I've already expressed uh, about 2017 about having, you know, $75 billion in unfunded liability. Uh, that, that's problematic. But, but let's, 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 let's go forward. And I'm, I'm open to it. I'm just not completely convinced at this point. So, and we're happy to share Enough more information because we don't believe that will happen, and we're happy to share that. Yeah. The other, the other concern I have with respect to the going to a five-day delivery is that you're in a competitive world out there. If you're saying now we're going to have a two-day market for your competitors, people are going to rely less on the post office. Uh, I think there's a downside as well as an upside. I think, uh, you know, I, I think there's a certain uh, – there's a certain loss of market share when you become a five-day delivery post office instead of a seven-day delivery post office. And, and uh, I recognize that might be the reality of the situation. That may be what we have to do. It's not my first option, though. And I, I frankly think that, uh, you know, we, we've, got, we've got some other things we've got to look at. And that might involve looking at some of these areas that have high-density uh, placement for post offices. Uh, I'm not talking about our rural areas, but... You know, uh, we have some of our big cities in America who have, you know, a post office in every high rise. Uh, they've got the volume, or they had the volume at one time to justify all those, but we may have to look at some of those things. And uh, I'd like to look at the least disruptive measures to reduce cost than simply leaping to five-day delivery. But you're right. I think time is growing short. We have to fish or cut bait and, you know. We're going to be limited in our options with the passage of time. So, I certainly agree with you that we're we're at a we're at a critical point here. Let me uh, again. Obviously, we've gone to a second round of, of questioning. I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Utah, uh, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate it. And, uh, Governor, I uh, I guess I'm still mystified, and and perhaps we'll have to clarify this in the later. But I, I recognize the series of indicators along the way of the, the remarkable progress that has been made uh, within the Postal Service. But to try to categorize uh, as one of those goals the financial health, I, 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 that was the quote that I wrote down, financial health, um, while it may be better, I don't think it's healthy. And um, I think it's very difficult when you have a reduction in overtime, when you have the good men and women, the rank and file, the person who's out there delivering the mail, brunting. Uh, the bulk of what has to happen in order to make these adjustments to see somebody at the very top take a bonus. That, in my opinion, it gets strikingly close, if not over the line, of just trying to run around the basic compensation package and trying to say, we're going to subvert this because we think it's too low, we're going to give a performance bonus, and that's how we're going to get them. You can make a case, I think, to say that the overall compensation for somebody who's running the second largest uh, a second largest uh, employer in the United States of America, 260 some odd thousand dollars is too low. I, I think that's another discussion that perhaps we, we have to have. But I worry that that bonus is so striking and so offensive to a lot of people that I would hope and encourage you to revisit that because at the end of the day, it was in the red. And we're going to have to make some much more dramatic challenges. And we're asking people to potentially take, uh, go back to five-day service as opposed to six, and yet we're handing out bonuses. It just doesn't add up, and that, that's my concern. My, my question uh, to you, Governor, and then I actually do have one for Ms. <laughs> Mr. Blair, if we can get to it. The relocation assistance policy is something I've seen some reports on that seems to be troubling. The huge, massive dollars and numbers of, of homes that are going through this process we, what kind of trajectory, what kind of numbers are behind this, and, and what, what is your sense of where this program is? Uh, well, first of all, uh, we were, the Board of Governors was concerned when we heard the same stories that you did. Uh, management is reviewing the policy. Uh, we will look at it, the Board will look at it when he's completed 
that's that review or they have completed that review. When, when do you think we'll have that back? Uh, I know they're in, in consultation with the management associations and I'm not sure how long that process is. Uh, but I, you know, we don't just buy these homes, we also sell these homes. Do you homes. know how much money the government or the Postal Service put in? I mean, they, there was a real cost to this, was there not? It wasn't something to operate in the black. Uh, Congressman, I actually don't know. I, I guess I, I would ask that it, at some point that the, the report be given back to us specific to that program, how much it costs to, to actually execute on that program. And, and in the essence of time, uh, Mr. Blair, I, I, I do have a, just a quick question. It's a, more of a clarification. My understanding, I thought I heard, and maybe I'm wrong here, I thought I heard Mr. Uh, uh, Potter talk about a $3.5 billion savings by going to a five-day week. You had talked about a $2 billion savings. What's what is the actual number? And maybe I just heard something wrong here, so my apologies. Well, our projections at the commission would be that there would be a $2 billion savings. I believe the uh, services projections uh, did not take into account any volume declines that would result from reducing one day a week delivery. Ours projected a 2% a 2 volume decline. So that's, that's how we determined our cost savings. Okay, so I did hear Mr. Potter correctly at 3.5, but you're saying that you think it'll actually be close to a 2 billion. We projected it at 2 billion. The service did acknowledge that there would be uh, volume reductions. It just didn't factor them in. Just didn't factor Because they didn't know what they would be at that point. Is there any sort of blended analysis? Like, for instance, you know, we talked to, I, there was some discussion about maybe limiting service in some of the days in the summer when, you know, it's in the middle of July and there's not much mail delivered, as opposed to, say, the end of December when you have huge surges in the amount of mail that has to be dealt with. I think that that's a good point. That's, that's a question I wanted to uh, raise as well, is that before, I, I would strongly recommend that Congress, before it grant, it, should it grant the Postal Service that ability to reduce one day a week delivery, that it asks the service for a more detailed plan over on what this exactly looks like. We heard today from the Postmaster General that it would likely be Saturday, but I've heard other days being touted, like possibly Tuesday, which is Tuesday or Wednesday. I think a, a more concrete plan, is this going to be nationwide or is it going to be just select for selected areas of the country or even selected zip codes? I'm under the impression it would be na nationwide, but again, I don't want to presume anything. Uh, there are just a lot of unanswered questions, and given that reduction of this scope has such an impact on the brand of the U.S. Postal Service, I would hope that Congress would ask the service for a more detailed plan along these lines. Uh, I think one missing question is, what's going to be the impact on volume? What's going to be the impact on major mailers? Uh, we would hope the Postal Service could produce for us what would be seen as a, uh, what their best estimate would be on the reduction in volume and the impact on mailers. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I hope <coughs> that this is something we continue to explore, that we look at the differences between urban areas and rural areas, that we look at potentially a sliding scale where there are times at certain times of the year. And as you said, uh, look at the reduction in, in volume as well, because obviously that will play a major impact. The number between $2 billion and $3.5 is a big enough number that it meets that threshold. Usually a billion dollars is just a rounding error in, in, this, uh, in this body, but, you know, it meets that threshold. So let's, uh, let's dive into it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Blair, let me ask you, let's assume that we do all of the things that Mr. Potter talked about earlier in terms of streamlining staff reductions. <laughs> But let's also assume that we do not have pass H.R. 22. How long do you think it would be before we would be back talking about another rate increase? Well, it, the, they, the Postal Service just, the Commission last week gave its approval of the Postal Service's request for an inflation-based adjustment. Those rates are going to come into effect in May provide annually, from what we understand, probably about a billion and a half dollars in additional revenue. The other option open to them at this point well, real, uh, would be an exigency rate case in which the Postal Service would propose to go above the inflation-based cap based on extraordinary and exceptional circumstances. That proposal uh, lies in the hand of the Postal Service. Uh, whether or not that would generate the sufficient uh, revenues to offset the potential cash flow problem, uh, th that's a good question. I think you'd be 
uh, but I think that this committee would be back, we would be convened back before this committee before that would happen because postal finances would continue to go south. You think there's ever any danger that we could price, price ourselves out of the market? I think in some marketplaces you definitely could, and I think that was the intention behind the uh, po the Postal Act of 2006, is that keeping generally cla uh, generally within the class or generally uh, inflation-based rates would be a good thing. It would add to the predictability and stability for mailers to stay in the system. Ms. Gallagher, let me ask you, one of the criticisms that I've heard of the Postal Service in relationship to its efforts to grow volume has been sort of an internal isolation relative to the, the, the community of ideas that um, the Postal Service sort of does its thinking internally and that external entities that come with ideas that these generally are not uh, received too well or viewed too positively. Uh, how open do you think the Postal Service is to listening to other marketing ex experts and individuals who think they've got ideas? You know, as elected officials, everybody come to us with everything. And sometimes these things can get vetted, sometimes they don't. Uh, sometimes they get looked at, and sometimes they're given a uh, short shrift that, you know, uh, how open is, is, is the Board of Governors in relationship and the Postal Service to looking at these kind of options and ideas that people come with. Uh, Congressman Davis, in, in the, I, I don't think we can afford not to listen to any option, uh, given the situation that we're in. And I think the Postal Service has a long history of communicating with stakeholders, all our stakeholders. Uh, the board is, of course, very open to hearing ideas. In fact, we're, we're having a, dinner, uh, a lunch with mailers, the mailing community, next week. So uh, we're very open to hearing ideas, and certainly, in the, given the situation we're in, uh, any <coughs> ideas would be helpful. Well, let me just say, I don't envy uh, the position that you're in in actuality, because I do realize that there are no simple solutions to very complex problems and very complex issues. And I do appreciate the efforts that the Postal Service is making I appreciate uh, the leadership that Mr. Potter has been providing and the efforts of the Board of Governors. And I thank you very much, and I yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, let me ask, uh, I want to go over the, the, the area of uh, housing relocation within the Postal Service. Uh, there was a story a few weeks back, uh, I think it was CNN that ran a story about the excessive costs that uh, were being incurred by the uh, Postal Service for relocating their employees. And there were, there were some homes there uh, that they were excessive, well, the employees were excessively reimbursed for relocation expenses. And uh, I know I have some information that the Post Office provided uh, to the committee. Uh, it indicated that uh, the relocation program cost at the United States Postal Service in 2007 was uh, $72 million for the relocation, and then expenditures specific to homeowners were $34 million, so it was a total of $106 million uh, in, in 2007. And then similarly, in 2008, it was $71 million for the relocation program in 2008, with a reimbursement to the homeowners of uh, 108 million. So these, these are sizable programs. And uh, Ms. Gallagher, I know you mentioned that there, there's, a, there's a, a Board of Governors review going on here. Has, has the Inspector General uh, for either the Post Office or the, uh, the Postal 
uh, Regulatory Commission? Have they, have they been invited in or asked to conduct an investigation yet? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the board is not reviewing the policy. Management is reviewing the policy. Just management? Yes. The board is waiting to uh, see how the policy is revised. Uh, we have full confidence in Mr. Potter that he will address it appropriately. I, I do think I mean, the fact that we have a relocation assistance policy is standard among federal agencies and certainly the, the private sector. Uh, we do have a policy that you hire the best person for every job. And so that's going to require moving people around. And with 650,000 employees, uh, sometimes those are going to be big numbers. So we have very, uh, confidence that Mr. Potter is reviewing the policy, that, he's gonna, uh, that he and his team will show the board a policy that is appropriate. Yeah, well, you know, there are a lot of opportunities. And, and sometimes the differentiation between employees, when you're talking about a pool of 650,000 people, sometimes, you know, they're, they're all things being equal. Uh, they can be very similar, uh, very talented employees at the post office. And so I'm just concerned about this. this it's, a tr it's a pretty large expense, over $100 million. Uh, I, I am aware that, that uh, management is considering adopting a new rule where they don't reimburse for a house over a $1 million, uh, which leads me to believe the policy before allowed them to go above a $1 million. And, and I'm not sure how, how much above and uh, even though CNN has pointed out some, I would call them uh, egregious examples, uh, I, I want to know, uh, is this the rule or, or what, what have we here? I have a bulk number of, uh, you know, 100, well, $71 million for housing relocation in, in, in 07 and then a little bit more than that in 08. Uh, I really need the numbers. I need the breakdown on home by home. Uh, what region they were moved from, and two, I, I need all that information. Could you, could you make sure that's available to the committee? We will certainly supply that. I, the policy that we're reviewing is looking at taking it down to 800000 and not a million. Okay. So, uh, but management is reviewing it, and we'll get you that information for the record. Okay, that would be great. And I, I do intend to ask, we have the Inspector Generals coming up, and, I, and I'll ask them about that as well. Uh, I, I am told that we're about to have votes on the floor, um, but why don't we swap out? I, I want to thank you both for your willingness to come before the committee and to testify. You've been very helpful, uh, and we thank you for your testimony. We wish you a good day. Thank you. And why don't we, if we have the next panel, please uh, take their, their seats. That would be great.
excuse me, hello, Mr. Williams and Mr. Hare. Uh, we appreciate you appearing before the committee. It is the, it is the committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. Uh, could I ask you to please rise and raise your right hands? Do you, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Welcome, gentlemen. Mr. David Williams, Inspector General, the Office of the Inspector General for the United States Postal Service, was sworn in as the second independent Inspector General for the United States Postal Service in August of 2003. Mr. Williams has served as IG for five federal agencies. He was first appointed by President George H.W. Bush to serve as IG for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission from 1989 to 1996. Uh, President Will William Clinton next appointed uh, Mr. Williams, in Inspector General for the Social Security Administration from 1996 to 1998, and then as Inspector General for the Department of the Treasury in 1998. Uh, Mr. Philip Herr is Director of Physical Infrastructure Issues, United States Government Accountability Office. He is the Director of Physical Infrastructure Team at the Government Accountability Office, and since joining GAO in 1989, uh, Mr. Herr has managed reviews of a broad range of domestic and international programs. His current portfolio focuses on prog programs at the Department of Transportation and the U.S. Postal Service. Welcome, gentlemen, and uh, the committee invites opening statements. Mr. Williams. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chavitz and Mr. Davis, the, the Postal Service's current financial condition is fragile, and the future is uncertain. The Postal Service lost $2.8 billion in 2008 and may lose $6 billion this year. Yet these losses should be placed in context. Without payments to prefund retiree health benefits, the Postal Service would have earned $2.8 billion in 2008, and its anticipated net loss for 2009 would have been $1 billion. Mail volume has declined for the last eight quarters, and the rate of the decline is accelerating. Single-piece first-class mail volume continues to give way to the Internet as expected. New declines in business and advertising mail are closely connected to the condition of the hardest-hit sectors in this historic economic crisis. The Postal Service must make eight more annual payments averaging $5.6 billion each to prefund retiree health benefits. The Postal Service annual borrowing of $3 billion may not be enough to cover the gap between revenue declines and cost-cutting measures. This could cause the Postal Service to run short to pay ca of cash to pay its, all of its bills. As a near-term strategy, the Postal Service is chasing revenue declines with cost cuts to limit losses. For example, even before the recent volume losses, the Postal Service had reduced its workforce through attrition by more than 134,000 career employees since 1999. This year, the Postal Service has set a challenge of reducing the equivalent of 48,000 full-time employees. The Postal Service has streamlined its network operations, closing airport centers, annexes, and remote encoding centers. It is increasing its effort to consolidate processing facilities. However, if staff reductions are not coordinated with facility reductions, the Postal Service runs the risk of having protracted, anemic staffing within an oversized network. Working with city and rural carriers, the Postal Service has started restructuring the delivery routes to reflect declining mail volume. The Postal Service has reduced authorized staffing at headquarters and at area and district administrative offices. And through a new rapid negotiation program, the Postal Service plans to work with its contractors to cut a billion dollars from its existing contracts. But cost reductions must be done carefully. One concern is that the Postal Service may cut costs so rapidly and broadly that it will be difficult to monitor the changes and guard against unintended consequences. Aggressive cost reduction in the short term could adversely affect service, productivity, and the Postal Service's ability to offer innovative products and, paradoxically, reduce its profits in the long term. Even if the Postal Service achieves its desired cuts, there will still be a gap between costs and revenues of as much as $6 billion if the current estimates hold. Action beyond the Postal Service's authority may be needed. 
The Postal Service has requested limited pre-funding relief. I support its request. Moreover, in this current economic climate, it may be appropriate to skip the mandated pre-funding payment for one year or to restructure the payments. The large prepayments of more than $5 billion a year are greater than the Postal Service's annual net income in its very best years. The Postal Service is forced to borrow to meet this aggressive payment schedule. And borrowing today to set aside money for a debt that will not be due until the future is an unusual practice. Removing the annual $3 billion debt limit should be considered. The current limit of $3 billion per year may encourage unnecessary borrowing to retain cash as a hedge against future needs. Beyond the current crisis, the larger issue that must be explored from an elevated vantage point is the unfolding information revolution. New social dynamics and technological innovations such as the internet are bringing great changes to the use of shipping and mailing services. Other sectors such as newspapers and periodicals and telecommunications are also being transformed. Close monitoring and in-depth analysis are needed to ensure that the essential roles of these industries are fulfilled and that the needs of all Americans, including those in rural and poor urban areas, continue to be met. The Postal Service, along with its stakeholders, must focus strategically on its future to discover viable options and find its place with other information age industries. Change, however beneficial, is disruptive, and my office is very cognizant of the fact that more than 700,000 families directly depend on the Postal Service for their livelihoods. However, if the, these families are at risk of becoming the first casualties if the Postal Service is unable to adapt rapidly to this new and changing environment. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hare. Thank you. Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chavitz, Congressman Davis. I'm pleased to be here today to participate in this oversight hearing on the financial condition of the U.S. Postal Service. As requested, my statement addresses the Postal Service's financial condition and outlook and options to help it remain financially viable in the short and long term. First, regarding the Postal Service's financial condition. Updated projections for this fiscal year suggest the magnitude of the challenges ahead. Mail volume could decline by 22 billion pieces a record 11 percent over fiscal year 2008. While much of this decline is rated, related to the housing market downturn, the credit crisis, and lower retail sales, mail volume is expected to decrease for the foreseeable future as businesses, nonprofits, governments, and households continue to move to electronic alternatives. Its net loss is projected to be $6.4 billion if it cuts almost $6 billion in costs, which would be unprecedented. Further, it faces a cash shortage of about a billion and a half dollars. Mr. Chairman, turning now to short and long-term options. No single action will assure the Postal Service's short and long-term financial viability. The service has high overhead costs that cannot be changed quickly, including six-day delivery and retail services at 37,000 facilities. Compensation and benefits for almost 650,000 career employees and all about 100,000 non-career employees generate close to 80 percent of its costs. Several options have been discussed to assist the Postal Service through its short-term difficulties, some of which would require congressional action. The Postal Service has proposed that Congress give it an immediate financial relief by reducing payments to the Postal Service Retiree Health Benefits Fund by an estimated $25 billion over the next eight years. This would decrease the available balance in the fund by approximately $32 billion, including interest charges, in 2017. Another option would be for Congress to provide the Postal Service with two-year relief for its fund payments, totaling $4.3 billion, which would provide immediate financial relief and have much less long-term impact on the fund. We believe this option is preferable. This would allow Congress to revisit the Postal Service's financial condition in two years while assessing actions taken in the interim to improve its financial viability. In other words, this approach would keep pressure on the Postal Service to make needed changes. However, it's not clear that either of these options will be sufficient to present a, prevent a cash shortfall from developing this year or next. Looking to the longer term, progress will be needed in many areas to reverse the growing gap between Postal Service revenues and expenses. In January 2009, the Postal Service asked Congress to eliminate the longstanding statutory provision mandating six-day delivery. In doing so, it provided little information on where it would reduce delivery frequency and the potential impact on costs, mail volumes, revenues, mailers, and the public. Stakeholder input could be provided through an advisory opinion from the Postal Regulatory Commission. 
Major changes in universal service should also be done in close consultation with and approval from congressional stakeholders. Controlling wage and benefit costs will also be critical. One option will be for the service and its unions to agree on changes during upcoming negotiations in 2010 and 2011. The Postal Service has alternatives to provide lower cost retail services at places other than traditional post offices, such as selling stamps at supermarkets, drugstores, by telephone, and over the internet. In the mail processing area, the Postal Service has closed most of its airport mail centers in recent years, but only one of over 400 major mail processing facilities. Closing facilities would be controversial, but it's necessary to streamline costs. Options also exist to reduce postal transportation and delivery costs. In closing, Mr. Chairman, accelerating declines in mail volume mean that the Postal Service could run out of cash this fiscal year. Thus, short-term relief is urgently needed, as well as comprehensive action to maintain the service's financial viability. This concludes my prepared statement. I'd be pleased to answer any questions you or other members have. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, both, both of you. Uh, as you may have heard, we've got a couple of votes, just two votes on the floor. I expect we should be back here in about 25 minutes. Again, I apologize to all of you. Thank you.